Good morning, everybody. It's 10 o'clock, and we are about to start first call with Jake Kilby. There he is, Jake, a.k.a. the doctor. Before we get started, let's everyone take a look at the disclaimer. I'm nowhere near as good as uh, the King Chameleon Dimitri is reading this, but basically neither Mark Chameleon, myself, or Jake are registered BDs. Read all the fine print, but this is for educational purposes only. Hopefully it helps you out. With that, we are starting our Zoom meeting, live YouTube webinar with Jake Kilby. How are you doing this morning, Jake? I'm really good, thanks. Uh, really well. So uh, ready to ready to rock and roll. Thanks for thanks for having me on again. I'm just going to dive in and share my screen. Well, wait, but wait, 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 wait. Before we get oh. going, I got to ask you two things. First, what is that above your upper <laughs> lip? <laughs> you can barely see it through the shade, but it's it's awesome looking. I can tell that. It's, it's Secondly, what's mustache. your favorite options book? <laughs> yeah, my favorite uh, options book is the John C. Hall, which is options, futures, and other derivatives. I think I've shared it before with a couple of guys asking me on the Discord. The other one I like, which is actually a recommendation from Dimitri, was the, I think it's Sheldon Nattenberg, and he does a a book on options as well. You know, they're pretty thick. They're, they're acad you know, it's academia. But, uh, you know, if you've got sleepless nights, the John C. Hull will definitely do it for you. Really good book. Uh, you know, a lot of guys have asked me before. I recommend doing the exercises on YouTube. You've also got a walkthrough of, you know, the, the answers as well. So that one there really is the, uh, the Bible and uh, highly recommend it. Now, now, Jake just mentioned Discord. He runs a Discord for Mark Chameleons. Well, really for any trader investor with uh, another friend of the chameleon community raj who does a show as well and they've created a great discord channel all things trading investing life related they give life coaching lessons uh, massage whatever online yoga uh it's a it's a great channel that's all a joke i mean it's really trading related obviously uh i will put the link to the discord if that's all right jake in the chat yeah, no problem all right awesome everyone well with that let's get started doc Okay, so look, thanks for having me back, uh, guys. Today, we're going to do, we're going to, you know, for the last two or three sessions, I've been trying to cram in something on watch lists and a bit of a macro overview. And I've always sp specifically spoken about the short side, so short term trading, you know, the one week or sorry, the one day to 30 days out. Today, we're going to speak more specifically on the longer stuff, which, you know, is a different, I would say, technique, etc. And we're going to kind of link that into watch lists. Now, one of the things that I do, Particularly, I've got my own little punch list of things I, I go through every day. And so a little punch list I've developed uh, over the years. One of them is normally I'll dial in onto the, the pre-market show. I'll listen to what Dimitri's got uh, to say about the market. You know, often there's some really good educational stuff as well uh, about the platform. And then afterwards, the first 30 minutes, I pretty much first 30 minutes to one hour, I pretty much don't do anything because you generally got a you know, degree of volatility in the market as it sorts itself out. But one thing I do do is I actually have a look and I post this normally on the Discord, a bit of an overview. And you can see it here. We've got a bit of a current stock price performance overview of the main asset classes. And then we've got a bit of a chart on volatility. And I'm just going to dial into the chameleon. Where you can find that is here on the options tab. You go down to snapshot and you've got it here. So yeah, market started. This has got a 15 minute delay, right? So the first time you'll see data is about 9.45 a.m. in the States, 9.45 p.m. for me. And this gives you a bit of an overview. Normally what I'll do is I'll take a little bit of a snapshot of it and then give a little bit of a, you know, a bit, bit of feedback on what I think, you know, where we're at in the day's trading session. Now you can link that to price performance with different holding periods you know, and gives you a bit of an overview of how the different asset classes have performed, right? So we've got consumer discretionary staples, energy, financials, et cetera. And you can see how these asset classes perform. If you look at energy here, 52.8%, it's really a turnaround story because it was probably the most unloved asset class of last year. So really interesting. What I'll normally do with that, just for guys you know, more interested on the operational day-to-day -day trading opportunities and stuff, here you've got a few tabs. So you've got SPY, DIA, and QQQ. Before we didn't have the Qs, we just had SPY, but we got them uh, programmed in, which was really cool. And I'd normally go to, I'd normally go onto that, and then I'd actually go down here 
and look at what's, you know, who are the real laggards in the S&P 500. And from there, what I'd potentially do is link that maybe to a watch list, or, you know, if I knew that, you know, this is, you know, something's going, you know, there's a post earnings play to be had or whatever, then I'd look into these. I wouldn't just directly, you know, dial in a trade, but it gives me a bit of an overview, particularly because I'm more of a contrarian. So I'll buy into weakness and normally I'll sell into strength. So just that, that's a very brief overview of the, you know, that functionality on the market chameleon. So let's just press ahead and now speak about the watch list I wanted to show you on TWS. And what you've got here is a script, you know, it's a screenshot of my, uh, my watch list I've developed on, on TWS. Now, what I'm going to do post show is I'll actually share this data on the Discord. So anyone who's interested in doing it, you know, whether you're working, you know, whether you use the interactive brokers platform or whatever, then you can dial in and develop your own watch list. And these are particularly useful because they'll give you really a view at 50,000 feet of, of what's happening. You can see this one here is quite extensive. Let's just go on to TWS Live, which is this one here. And I'll just show you um, how, how I did it. So on TWS, you can, and I'm pretty sure you can do this with most brokerage platforms. You can create your own tabs. And from those tabs, you can just develop a you know, watch list. So I've done, I've started one here, which gives you, you know, North American equities, the key ones. Then we've got the, you know, the broad asset classes in, in ETF form. And you can pretty much do whatever you want. So you just right click, you know, you create a group header and I could do like, you know, world indices and I could use an ETF to do that, right? So click on that, hit okay. And I could do, for example, I want, I want EWJ, which is, you know, an ETF for Japan. I could put Italy in there or whatever. And it takes a little bit of time to develop, but it's something which is very useful. And probably what I would recommend, or at least what I do as, as a money manager, it's one of these things that I check off in the first 30 minutes of trading, right? So I'm not really buy, sell, buy, sell within the first 30 minutes. I'm kind of, I've gone through the pre-market and then I'll go and have that look at 50,000 feet at what's happening with different asset classes. You can build that up. Here's a, a real one. So let me just... So this one's one I've done already, and you've pretty much got everything in there, right? So you've got US, you've got fixed incomes or interest rate sensitive plays, Asia Pacific, Europe, the Americas, et cetera. Crude oil, energy was an important one for me, financials, you know, thematics, et cetera. So you can build these however, you know, how, to however, or to whichever deep level of detail you so desire. But I recommend that it's something that you, you know, get into a rhythm of doing is to, you know, rather than just diving in, uh, you know, head first into the equity pool, whatever, particularly during the first opening hour of trading, just to sit back a bit and see what's happening, you know, in terms of price action, etc. So let's just go back here. So that gives you a bit of an overview. Now, what I'll do is I'll share this list on the Discord, and then you guys can go build your own, you know, watch lists on your trading platforms uh, as well. Now, what we're speaking about today is more like the view at 50,000 feet and macro setups, right? So we've had before, let's see if I can make a little magic marker. We're speaking more about this bit, right? So we've already spoken a little bit about the short, you know, short duration side. So what I'm speaking specifically about here is things like, you know, earnings plays, you know, the, these, you know, they could be unusual options, act, uh, I'm sorry, unusual options activity, things like that on the more, you know, zero to 30 day side. On the more mid-range side for me, it's, you know, things like synthetics uh, or potentially futures contracts. And then more importantly, what we're going to speak about today is kind of, you know, using top-down analysis, the, those watch lists, that macro, uh, you know, that, the, that macro data set to try and build a strategic portfolio holding. Now, what this is, is completely different to the short side and the research skills, et cetera, are different as well. Whereas... With a short, you know, short duration play, you may spend maybe an hour, you know, doing a bit of research before you take a position, do your research on the chameleon and, and uh, dial something in. Whereas on something more of a strategic side, I'm speaking about risky assets you'll hold for more than a year, right? So for me, just to give you guys an overview, uh, we're speaking about, I think today, maybe between five and 10 different uh, securities. And let's just, you know, guesstimate, I'm thinking about maybe I've got six stocks, roughly, and I've held them for more than a year, and then maybe I'll have three or three or four different, you know, fixed income positions, right? On this side, which is really short duration, it's going to be much bigger. So, and this might surprise some people. I think some guys asked me in the Discord, and they were surprised. Here, I'll be speaking, and I'll be talking about anything between thirty to fifty different setups, options plays mostly, 
actively managed, etc. And then here you probably have maybe a little less, right? Maybe maybe 20, 20 to 30 different positions managed over a more midterm time frame. Now be careful with that because you think, well, that's you know, maybe about a hundred different positions. They're not all managed in the same fashion. You know, the short-term ones are managed more actively. The, the strategic portfolio holding and potentially the seasonal setups are maybe more on autopilot. The other thing to take into account is, you know, I think most of our, our audience here is predominantly based in the US. Well, me, my trading day starts early in the morning where I'll do, you know, I'll do the Australian Stock Exchange. We'll look at Singapore. We'll look at Hong Kong. Uh, maybe less so Hong Kong now, particularly with the you know degree of intervention and, and regulatory intervention uh, in in China with, with equities. But then after that, the afternoon for me will be Europe, right? So, and I think I just placed a, a position which I recorded on the Discord on Dax futures, and then the main course, which is today, uh, which is in the evening for me, is you know the uh, world's biggest uh, capital market or equity market, which is the United States. So. Of those, you know, between 60 to 100 different positions, which are options, futures, FX positions, fixed income, and stocks, you know, a, a degree of them cover, you know, quite a bit of the world. It's not just in one geography. So let's just keep going. And this is where we're going to get into our, our top-down analysis. And I'm speaking about long duration holds, right? So things you're going to hold, stocks or whatever, that you're thinking of holding for one, two, three, four, five years or whatever. And the research and develop, or well, the research part of that is, I would say, more extensive on those long plays. You really need to become familiarized with the stock, the market, uh, the industry, and you know the economic outlook for you know the you know the company which it involves. Uh, I would say in a more detailed manner. So, you know, I've put down here just for record things that I use. You guys can use whatever you want, but you know. For economic indicators, the Federal Reserve is really good, BLS uh, and the BEA. University, University of Michigan is great for consumer surveys, uh, also housing prices. Um, I think I'm short, yeah, I'm short ITB. I posted that on the Discord. And I did that from a lot of research that I got out of consumer surveys coming out of the University of Michigan surveys, uh, quite good. One for the newbies and people who don't wanna to get too involved or too deep in the weeds of macroeconomic data, just trading economics, right? It's just a really simple website. You know, it's uh, nothing too extreme. Gives you some great, uh, you know, economic data on countries, you know, interest rates, whatever it may be, currencies, etc. Really good one for people to familiarize themselves with. And look, I use, uh, well, I watch Bloomberg all the time, but, you know, you choose your poison. You can do CNBC or Bloomberg. I, I would take either with a pinch of salt. You know, I do post stuff on Discord regarding, you know, inputs from Bloomberg, et cetera, use that to start to develop, you know, uh, and build a, a data bank, et cetera. And what I'm trying to get at here is when you're, you know, rather than diving into, okay, I'm going to buy a stock here, I'm going to buy Apple, as a strategic portfolio holding, for example, you really want to do a lot of, you know, crunching and, and uh, work on this side. So understanding monetary, po oh, oopsie daisy, sorry. No worries. No worries. You know, understanding things like monetary policy in the United States, fiscal policy, rates, growth, etc. These are things that you want to become familiarized with. After that, then you've got kind of industry analysis. Now here, what you see is I've kind of chosen, you know, oil and gas, right? Because, you know, that's one of the big themes at the moment. And I've put a few that you could look into from an industry level, such as, you know, OPEC has a, a decent website. You've got the IEA. I listen to you know a lot of the public or not listen but i read a lot of the publications that they put out and, and some of the data sets that they provide api for guys in the united states uh, you know 10 10 12 million barrels a day of of uh, of crude oil produced in the united states a big uh, oil producing nation so one to be um you know one to follow the api now for the crude oil traders guys who actually trade crude oil futures like myself another one which is more I would say tactical in terms of its time frame is the Baker Hughes uh, rig count. You know, Baker gives a, a, a rig count, and these are rigs uh, in the United States. Okay, so this is not going to give you the footprint of you know EMP output throughout the world. It'll give you the footprint of the United States, but it's really valuable information because it gives you some info on the shale patch, for example, and you know the Gulf of Mexico and uh, all the assets they've got offshore. Really interesting one worth looking at. It's it's really, uh, I would say, something which is uh, 
you, you go post, go have a look at the Baker Hughes rig count compared to, you know, we went through this uh, pandemic, you know, uh, the uh, earlier stages of last year, we had crude oil uh, futures in negative territory, I think around maybe February or March sometime last year, maybe minus $40 a barrel or whatever. And then a, a post pandemic pop to the point where we're at like 83, $84 on West Texas Intermediate today. And I think we're about 85, $86 on, on Brent. So these are the kinds of things that I'm looking at as a, you know, a, a crude trader or someone who's interested in the energy industry from a top down perspective. You know, you get into the industry uh, weeds before you then go and choose, hey, I want to, you know, I want to go with Chevron or, or whatever that may be. The other one to look at if you're interested in energy and you, anyone can ping me on the Discord, by the way, and ask me and I'll give you extra inputs or whatever. But uh, everything around, you know, uh, Cushing, Oklahoma is, is where um, you have, uh, well, futures contracts are settled, physical futures contracts are settled in Cushing, Oklahoma. So things around strategic reserves and stuff like that and uh, consumption of, of oil and oil related products, really important thing to follow. You can find them on, on a lot of these things. So on, I'm sure API, particularly trading economics as well. Now, really important thing, and I've highlighted this here, you've got to, if, when you're doing, uh, you know, peer comps or whatever, you've got to trade, you know, you've got to compare apples with apples. And what I mean by that is, you can't get a technology firm and then trade it with, for example, Toyota, because the capital structure is different, the revenue streams are different, and the margins are different. You'll find, you know, that that will, you know, skew your analysis. And I'm going to show you later on with two oil plays how your analysis can be skewed if you don't actually do this kind of, you know, macro overview before diving into a, a setup or a position. And this is where we get, you know, once we've drilled down through, you know, this macro to the micro uh, in terms of company analysis, we've got some good stuff on Market Chameleon. And I'm just going to drill back over to my Market Chameleon and I'm just going to choose, you know, no real reason why, but I'm just going to choose Chevron. And if we click on the ticker, we should get this dialed up. Here we go. Okay, 110 bucks, which is, uh, yeah, really... Um, a real move to the upside, I would say. What you can find on the chameleon, particularly for you know your analysis, are links to company websites. So one of the things I look at if I'm putting like you know fifty thousand dollars into a stock, one stock, and I think you know you know Chevron's it, I want to put all my money, I want to put money into it. Then I'll and it's a strategic portfolio holding. Then I'll spend a lot more time researching it, right? So things I'll look at specifically are press releases just to get a bit of an idea of what's happening. I'll also do that sometimes for unusual options activity and more shorter term things. And then the links. And the one that I want to encourage you guys to go and look at is uh, Edgar, which is on the SEC filings. And, and here, so on the chameleon, you get some really good fundamental info, you know, balance sheet, cash flow statement, you know, income statement. Here on the 10Ks and the reports, you can kind of put a narrative to those numbers. So I'm not going to, you know, bore you to death going through all of, you know, Chevron's financial statements. But one thing I would bring to your attention, really important reading the MDNA, right? So you go look at the numbers, you can look at them in a summarized version on the chameleon. But after that, go and look at the MDNA because you'll get management as, as, the, as, it, uh, as it infers, you'll get words to the numbers. And I'll speak about things like outlook guidance, MNA. You know, you know, guidance for energy in general, crude oil prices or whatever, and they'll have an impact, obviously, on on other things. So that's just Edgar in a in a nutshell. Let me just close that, and we'll keep pressing forward. Okay, so really important to kind of you know drill from the top down. Well, at least what I do, and what I encourage you to do, is you know don't dive headfirst into here and say I'm buying Apple just because you know. Uh, somebody on, on TV threw a pick at a screen and said, bye, bye, bye. Uh, particularly for strategic portfolio holdings and things that you're building your wealth and managing money on, then you really need to do a bit of groundwork and research, which you wouldn't normally have to do uh, otherwise. And let's have a closer look, right? So I've got a bit of macro data here and we're going to put a little, where's my little magic pen? We're going to put my CVX here, all right? And we're going to put my PBR here. Right, and I'm going to show you an example on the chameleon, which is a bit spurious, but it, it does illustrate a point. Now, this data here, macro, macro in, inputs on the US economy or, or you know, geopolitical demographics, you name it. But it's pretty telling, right? So you look at the US economy, real powerhouse in terms of uh, do, you know, gross domestic product, $21 trillion, uh, 300 million people. You look at uh, Brazil, 
you know, maybe 100, 120 million people less, but the size of the economy is significantly less. Now, the things you need to be looking at, uh, uh, you know, these macro indicators, interest rates, inflation, uh, because these are linked essentially. So if you get an overheating economy, then what sovereign banks will tend to do is raise interest rates. Once they raise interest rates, you generally get upwards pressure on currency prices. And when you get upwards pressure on currency prices, that has a whole heap of ripple effects on different parts of the economy. Then the other things, you know, you've got a post-pandemic pop here. So, you know, you think, if you look at this, you say, wow, 6.7% quarter on quarter GDP, the US is flying. I, I don't really believe so. I think you've got a bit of a post-pandemic pop with a lot of data uh, being skewed, uh, et cetera. And then, so you can, you know, delve into it and drive, drive it down. I think the key takeaways really is we've got a technology focused. So the US really is, is big tech focused, uh, service driven, uh, service driven economy, right? Importing more than exporting. The makeup is completely different from Brazil, right? So Brazil is a export commodity focused kind of a com uh, country. And the other thing which is really uh, telling is, you know, the US is, I would say, the land of free markets. We'll look at Brazil and look at the history of Latin America to a degree, you know, with the Simon Bolivar and all this kind of thing. It, it's very much a more socialist kind of, you know, interventionist regime, right, where, where governments, you know, will support uh, their companies and so forth. Now, this is really important, right? If we take it back to our, comp our companies, we've got Chevron, which is what I call an IOC. Uh, and Petrobras uh, and NOC. So Chevron, depending on which school you're from, but integrated oil company or international oil company, this is a company with a massive asset portfolio, a huge footprint throughout the world. And it is, when I say all over the place, I, I really mean it. So you've got upstream assets, you've got midstream and downstream, right? And even the you know, economic output of these three is different during times of high energy prices. Now, what I mean by that is right now for Chevron, Exxon, who have big upstream, you know, ENP assets, it's, it's really the upstream which will be making all the money. So the exploration, the you know, development of crude oil plays and so forth. The downstream bit will be suffering because normally this is a feed. So when I speak about downstream, I'm talking about hydrocarbon products and byproducts such as, you know, plastics and, you know, lipsticks, cosmetics, whatever, packaging, et cetera. Now, crude prices will be a feedstock into downstream, uh, you know, downstream uh, companies, which means that they will be facing, uh, you know, cost pressures on the raw material side, which will not be the same for the upstream side. Now, Petrobras is a completely different animal, and NOC, right? And this is quite interesting. This is a national oil company, like uh, Saudi Aramco, like Petronas here in Malaysia, etc. Now their economic makeup is completely different. So if you go and you compare the two, you think, wow, you know, Petrobras has got huge numbers, but it's skewed by the, if you don't have that grounding and have, have looked at the macro picture, then you, you may, you know, your analysis may be somewhat skewed. And what you'll find these days, you know, when we started developing oil assets at the end of the 19th century, you know, had a huge amount of private enterprise and so forth developing. And it was only really after the Second World War that you had, you know, Saudi Aramco come online, which was held by the Americans. And you've had Petrobras, you had Petronas, you've had a huge amount of public enterprise. Now that skews the picture. And another perfect example would be the airline industry. If you look at the airline industry, you know, US airlines or European airlines competing with Middle Eastern airlines, well, Middle Eastern airlines are essentially, well, to a, to a large degree, subsidized by governments. So the playing field is a bit different. So when you look at the financial statements of a Middle Eastern airline, you need to take that into account uh, when doing your analysis, right? So let's just, uh, I just wanna show you something on the chameleon. Let me just get rid of Edgar here. So we've got, we've got Chevron. One of the things I like looking at is, you know, peer comps, right? And you can just dive in here and you can pretty much go and analyze any company you want. So I'm gonna add Petrobras. And I'm going to add Royal Dutch Shell. Right? Now, what I recommend when you do your analysis, and I've done it intentionally here, but what I recommend you do is you really try to find similar sized companies because economies of scale come into play, et cetera. You know, Petrobras is a bit smaller. But if you look at this, you think, okay, 200 billion Chevron, 100, 200 billion Royal Dutch Shell, 70 bill for Petrobras. And then you go look at, you know, the revenue and you, you put this on a like for like basis and you think, wow, operating income for Petrobras, 38 percent. Wow, amazing. You know, 33 percent compared to three or four or whatever for, for Royal Dutch Shell. 
Now, the analysis there is somewhat skewed because what you need to understand is Petrobras is a state-run monopoly, which is pretty much deep water, pre-salt Brazilian oil fields, and that's it. So, and it's heavily subsidized, et cetera. So you've got a degree of wrangling and interventionism from the state, which you don't have with a Chevron. So you need to kind of take those things into account before you know, putting all your money on, for example, Petrobras. And that's really important. That's one of the one of the reasons why having that macro view and having a bit of an understanding of not only you know country risk, but also industry risk is important before diving knee deep uh, in an equity. So let's just keep going. And the last bit here, a little bit of a you know, famous one, one of my favorite films, and it shows my age, uh, Wall Street, the uh, Oliver Stone classic of the 80s. You know, we had Gordon Gecko. you guys probably all have heard of him, et cetera, saying, you know, the most valuable commodity I know of is information. And what he was speaking about there was uh, you know was uh, non material non public information right now trading on that's illegal, <laughs> so you will go to jail if you do it. But you know that's not the point. What I'm trying to get here is just to try and illustrate to you some of the mental gymnastics, particularly the newbies need to become accustomed to when managing money. Right, it's not all about buy sell buy sell. A guy told me on TV to buy this, so I went and bought this. You need to do as Dimitri mentions. You know, you need to do a lot of the, you know, risk management, money management work for yourself. So a couple of examples, right? And I've taken these as snippets from the Financial Times. I read this all the time. Uh, you know, we've had a, a, you know, a bit of a spat between China and, and Brazil around, around beef. So when I read that, I'm kind of thinking, well, what's happening with life, you know, life cattle futures? Are there products of substitution? What does that mean for Beyond Meat? Probably nothing, right? But these are the kind you, you need to think of, do that mental gymnastics around news flows to try and develop, you know, tradable or actionable ideas. You know, will, there, will there be any issues with the real? Probably not, because most, uh, you know, commodity contracts or trade is done, you know, in the United States dollar, which is the world reserve currency uh, presently. You now pressure on the global beef industry. You look at beef exports, Brazil is the biggest exporter of beef. But the second biggest is the United States. So what does this mean for you know, United States beef, et cetera? Another great example is Evergrande. We've, we've heard about Evergrande before. And it kind of, I've got this image, you know, you guys probably seen the naked gun where Leslie Nielsen's there standing saying, there's no problem, there's no problem, guys. And they've got guys and a house on fire and exploding and stuff. And I kind of think we're there with that Evergrande situation. The PBOC have come out and said, yeah, there's no problem, we can handle it. I'm not so sure. When I read that, I think, What's happening with equity risk premiums in China? They should be going up, right? Yields on Chinese debt. The foreign investors are going to be inclined to lend debt uh, to China in the future. Weighted average cost of capital implications, right? A company's made up of equity and debt. And companies in higher tax jurisdictions generally have more debt because there are tax advantages to holding it. So what does that do for the, you know, that debt side of things? Regional economic contagion as well is another big one. Now, Georgieva was, I think she's the head, you guys can correct me on the chat, I might be wrong. I think she's the head of the World Bank right now. There was a huge row because during her time at the IMF, she managed to massage a ton of, uh, allegedly, managed to mass massage a ton of economic data around China to paint a more favorable economic picture of the country so it would have you know, favorable treatment or whatever. And there was a big scandal and everyone said, she can't head the World Bank because you know, she, you know, she's kind of conflicted. Anyway, Europe have come out and said, no, we're staying by her. She's our man or our lady of who's going to lead the World Bank. You know, how I read it, read into that is, you know, German capital exports to China and handbags. I, I don't really think about the George Ava bit. I kind of do that mental gymnastics. And I think, you know, Germany is running a current account surplus. It is a, well, it's an industrial, the industrial engine of Europe, churning out loads of capital equipment, machinery, et cetera. They want to renew ties with China. It's very similar with France, right? France, the luxury capital of the world, handbags, Louis Vuitton, et cetera. And if you go and check the stock price of Vuitton down today, but they obviously also want to renew some form of ties. Energy crunch, you know, linking this together, I think Dimitri had a great example of that before. You know, inflationary pressures on consumer goods. What does that do for, you know, consumer discretionary? You know, are we going to get less or more or whatever? You know, these are the questions you need to ask yourself. What happens to interest rates if inflation heats up too much? Well, they're probably going to rise. And what then, then thereafter, what's going to happen to currency? The other thing to look at is, you know, dollar-denominated emerging market debt. You know, so a lot of emerging market countries have debt in US dollars. If the interest rates rise, that'll put a stranglehold on a lot of these economies, which are already suffering 
uh, in terms of you know government revenue streams through COVID and the like. So other things to think about. And last but not least, you know Fumio Kishida, who's replacing Abe, is you know steering Japan away from Abenomics. You know, to me, what's happening with negative interest rates? What's the impact for the yen? I think we're at a dollar fourteen today, so a really weak Japanese yen at the moment, and the impact on treasury holdings. And I think I've pretty much expended all my time. So that's me done for the day. Will, you're on mute. No, sorry about that. I, I was muting. Uh, so much going on, so much typing. I uh, no problem. muted myself because I occasionally have a terrible sneeze and uh, I don't want to no interrupt the show. That was awesome. Uh, great job. I'm, so many uh, comments about how much information you're bringing to the chameleon community, Jake. That really was uh, wonderful. So we're not going to get to the watch list today. We'll save that for another episode. No, we did. We, we, we did it. We All did right. it. We did it. All right. Time. Perfect. Perfect. Anything else for the chameleon community or you just want to leave them? I mean, you mentioned so much about China. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, you I think guess... China has, I mean, I, I know these Chinese ADRs have gotten destroyed. Uh, it could really get worse. And then yeah, the contagion yeah. to the other countries could be potentially terrible. I mean, is that what we're looking you know, at? I did a, yeah, I did a, uh, and I follow it quite, you know, living in Asia, I follow it quite quite closely. And I did a, a piece on TAL, uh, Teaching Advancing Learning, uh, the uh, Japanese tuition fund. And this was, you know, last year or whatever, and put a bearish call on it and said, look, the, the numbers just don't work out. And, you know, there, there can be significant earnings management. And it was funny, you know, the thing collapsed. And at that time, actually, it was a really good trade for me. And for me, it's kind of... Uh, I'm very, you know, I don't want to say it too negatively, but I'm very skeptical of a lot of the data coming out of, you know, uh, you know, out of the mainland and stuff like that. So I, I, I tread with, you know, um, uh, I take a lot of caution when, uh, when dealing with, you know, Chinese, you know, ADRs, equity, you know, even uh, equities on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange and the like. So, yeah, look, I, I guess the last, you know, closing thing for me really is for you guys want to find out more or engage a bit more actively on a day-to-day -day basis, get on the discord. I'm there all the time, answer direct messages, the like, no problems. And if you want more insights, whatever, or even share some of the things that you've got or you've learned or you've seen, I'd be, uh, I'd be more to, I'd be more than happy to hear about them as well. Perfect. I put that link again on the zoom. I will put it in the YouTube chat. Thanks everyone for joining a special thanks to Jake Kilby, AKA the doctor for, bringing it as uh, always a great show, Jake. Thanks so much. Okay. Thank you very much. All right.